So another scene in the adventures of international rescue is shot at the AP Film Studios in Slough, the safety town. Supermarionation is a new dimension in adult entertainment and the actors start here in the puppet workshop under the guidance of Birmingham sculptor John Brown. Heads are first made in plasticine, then moulded in glass fibre. Moving lips and eyes are added and then the crowning glory, the hair in the latest styles. Each main character has up to five heads with different expressions to suit the mood. The rest of the puppet is made in a plastic and is in the perfect proportion of one-third human stature with the hands and feet to suit the fitting. Any character can be made up from these interchangeable components. Each dressed puppet costs between 250 and 300 pounds. Often two units are shooting at once so an identical twin is made. Of the four film stages used for shooting Thunderbirds, two are for the special effects department under the inventive control of director Derek Meddings. Derek, how do you evolve the futuristic designs of your models? Well, usually I just start doodling on a pad and uh, whatever happens, uh, that's usually what we get in the time. Sometimes we have to dress them up a bit. What limits do you put on probability? Well, there aren't any limits as far as we're concerned. We try anything, and uh, if it doesn't work, then we usually cut round it. But uh, nine times out of ten, they work. Uh, there isn't any, as far as we're concerned, nothing is impossible in the special effects. How many special effects go into uh, an episode? Well, they vary. Some, uh, mostly, they're around about 90 per hour. Some, you know, they range up to 105. We've had as many as 130 in a, sh in a film. And uh, then we've really got problems. What are your greatest problems in the effect line? Anything that flies. Because it's always the wires, losing the wires against cloud and blue sky. So we have to, uh, well, we have secret little ways of doing it. And I'd rather not say how it's done. How do you maintain such realism? Well, we do little things that I think people don't, uh, they're not aware of when they look at a vehicle. But if a vehicle goes through screen, then we do a dust trail behind it. So there's always a certain amount of dust coming from uh, uh, the back of the truck or lorry, car, whatever it is. And then we have all the wheels sprung independently so that they get this movement and they don't just bounce up and down like a toy. And shooting at high speed, around about 72 frames, and sometimes as much as 120. That's as opposed to? 24. Which is normal. Yes, film but we can't shoot at 24. Not There's very few shots we can do at 24 on the special effects. Mm -hmm. Even if we shoot water, we always have to shoot at 72 frames so that it slows it down just that right amount to give us the realism again. Boats, things like this, we use um, little um, gadgets on the back that give us the wake. These are the things, if they're not there, people know that something's wrong with the shot and they're not really sure what it is, but if it's there, they just accept it. It's just like using any other, or just like watching any other boat going through picture. When you were a boy, were you fascinated by explosions? Yeah, I'm very destructive by nature. <laughs> I think that's why I'm in the special effects. Backstage, there's a vast empire of scenic design and model making. Everything is custom designed and built to scale. Houses, spaceports, Thunderbird craft, vehicles down to guns and watches. After use, they're either stored for the future or scavenged for new creations. All the models are identically reproduced in various scales to suit the scene, and a perfect continuity must be maintained. It's a model maker's paradise, spoiled only by the dirtying down process needed to give realism. Every kind of material is utilised, and the ingenuity of the operatives is endless, a great challenge that adds to the appeal. The puppets work on the sets under blistering arc lights ten times stronger than normal and their actions are controlled by 12-foot wires from above. Well, son, is you get settled down for the night. Gosh, Dad, how can I settle down in all this excitement? Well, the pre-recorded dialogue is fed through a lip-sync machine and the word impulses are transmitted to a solenoid in the character's head, causing the lips to move in perfect time with its voice. This near-realism is synonymous with all the work done by the AP film team of over 100. 
good boy and get up to sleep. The series is shot in full Eastman colour and is already being shown in Canada, Australia, Holland and Japan. But what is the adult appeal? The best man to answer this is Thunderbird's creator, Jerry Anderson. Well, of course, this is a, this is a question I would like to know the answer to because we, we very much want the films to have adult, adult appeal. Uh, I think that it's probably the technical fascination of seeing model characters and model machines um, behave in, in a realistic way on the screen. I think it is the wonderment, much the same way as with the Disney cartoons, one looked at animated figures and you know, couldn't believe that they, in fact, weren't real. And of course, I think from the point of view of creating fantasy, it is important to uh, make fantasy as believable as possible so that it is acceptable. This is what we try to do. What of the future? Live actors? Well, this is, this is a difficult one to answer. It's a question we ask ourselves at least once a week. Uh, I would very much like to make films with live actors. But, of course, the problem is that with live actors, you have to accept their faces as they are. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it would be quite as simple to get the strong characters that we succeed in getting in our films. And, of course, there would be many difficulties in creating the sort of situations we create at the moment with live artists. But I think one day, yes, we hope so. Whether the actors are human or puppets, Thunderbirds adds up to a unique contribution to world entertainment. Thunderbirds are go. FAB. <laughs>
Thunderbird 2 is often at the heart of the main action in the Danger Zone. One time, it was even mistakenly Three. shot down by the U.S. Navy. One. Zero. Fire! More height, Virgil. You need more height. Come in, Virgil. Virgil, are you okay? Virgil, pull her up. Virgil, you're crashing. Pull her up. Virgil, get a grip on yourself. You've got to pull out of that dive. Easy does it. Easy. Wheels, they've collapsed. Oh. I can't hold her. I'm I'm gonna crash. Release foam, section B. Luckily, there was no lasting damage and Virgil was okay. There is one particular aspect of Thunderbird 2 that we sure are proud of. The center section carries one of a selection of six pods, each housing a different rescue machine. <laughs> This business of all of the pods going up at Thunderbird 2 when it was getting ready for flight worked very well because you could believe then that there were, you know, all sorts of equipment and they were going to choose that particular equipment for this particular rescue. Three of my favourites are the transmitter truck, the mole and the firefly. Thunderbird 3, piloted by astronaut Alan Tracy, is really a giant space rocket. We use it for all space rescues, and it also provides us with a link to Thunderbird 5. It's the tallest vehicle in the International Rescue Fleet, measuring 200 feet in height. It launches from its concealed hangar beneath the Tracy Island Roundhouse. Thunderbird 3, well, I was never very keen on that. I mean, it was it was set for space rescues, and we used it a few times, but it never really excited me. N never really excited him? You cannot be serious. How can he say that? A a anyway, Thunderbird 4 is our underwater and sea surface craft piloted by aquanaut Gordon Tracy. It's usually carried to and from the danger zone aboard pod four, which is one of the six pods carried by Thunderbird two. Although it's much smaller than the other Thunderbird's craft and has a limited range, Thunderbird four plays a vital role in international rescues underwater operations. It's one of the fastest known craft on or under the sea.
It's a pretty nifty machine, and it saved the day on more than one occasion. Now, Thunderbird 5, usually manned by John Tracy, is International Rescue's space station and the nerve center of the organization's communications network. Base to Thunderbird 5. Through the use of sophisticated monitoring equipment and special filters, Thunderbird 5 is able to tune in to messages of distress in any language. I didn't like the design of Thunderbird 5, but it came in very useful because, of course, it received the distress calls in whatever language, it didn't matter. But also it had the side benefit that I hated John as a character and I was able to stick him up in Thunderbird 5 and leave him there for the whole series. That came in very useful for me. at headquarters, but when he and I went to check out a new monorail system, we found ourselves in real danger. Tracy, something's gone wrong. We're heading for trouble. And I mean trouble. The train hadn't been properly tested. We were running at full speed with no driver and no brakes. I'm gonna call the boys. It's too late. I realize that. But if you fail, we might need help after the crash. If we survive, how are you going to call them without Grafton knowing that we're international rescue? Leave it to me. But say, uh, Grafton, I wonder... Oh, what, 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 Tracy? Uh, have you thought of something? I don't know. Have you heard of international rescue? Uh, sure, I have. But no one knows who runs the outfit. Where do they come from? I can't say. But I believe to call them, you just send out a radio message. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. Somehow they, they pick it up. Come on! Keep at it, Brains. You're still our only hope. Somehow, I, I managed to work out a way of forcing the brakes into action. We're approaching a bend. You've got to stop this thing! All right. This is our last chance. <laughs> Going too fast! Oh, shut up. Wow! I thought we were never gonna get out of that one. But Mr. Tracy 
sure knew how to keep a cool head in a tough situation. Now, the Tracy brothers, Scott, Virgil, a a Alan, Gordon, and poor old John stuck up in space. Scott, the eldest, is fast-talking and quick-thinking. Right, Joe. Cover the takeoff. There was one time he had to act fast when he found out that security had been compromised because someone was videotaping Thunderbird 1. The automatic camera detector. Someone's photographing the ship. I told you guys no pictures. Listen, Buster. You've done a great job here today. Now let me do mine. I said no pictures. Please destroy them. If, if you, you think, think I, I do that, that you're crazy. crazy. Crazy fools. No deal, Joe. This is the best news story we have ever had. I'm not gonna lose it now. What's going on? I've electromagnetically wiped the videotape, Cook. The entire recording is blank. Now, sorry about this, but we must protect ourselves. So long. I, I, I think it's fair to say he's inherited his father's cool head. He's just bluffing. It's not possible. He wasn't bluffing. And it is possible. There goes your story, Ned. But if you're thinking Scott takes himself too seriously, then I'd say you'd be wrong. There was one occasion when two kids he'd rescued played a joke on him, but he took it all in good part. It up for us. Now you have to lie on the table, Mr. Tracy. Oh, well, I'll try anything once. Okay, Bob. Emergency, Scott. Away you go. Mr. Scott, we're sorry. I guess you're too heavy for our emergency exit. The things I do for international rescue. Virgil is the fearless one. He'll try anything if there's a chance of saving other people's lives. When we had to stop an out-of-control satellite hitting a major oil refinery, he even managed to force it off course using Thunderbird 2 as a lever. You've done it, Virgil. Oh, okay, well, level out. Things nearly went badly wrong. The satellite became magnetically sealed to Thunderbird 2 and seemed to be dragging us down with it. In the end, we just managed to miss the refinery and deflect the satellite into the desert.
Phew. That was close. Not many people know that Virgil is also a, a gifted pianist. It's another side to his character. He's a complex guy. Alan is the youngest. And I've always had the feeling he's kind of sweet on my assistant, Tintin. Um, Alan? Uh, yes, Tintin? I've got something for you. Something? For me? Oh, I know it's not your birthday until tomorrow, but come and see what I brought back for you. It's in the bathroom. The bathroom? <laughs> Hey, what do you suppose Tintin wants to show Alan in the bathroom? Can I open my eyes yet, Tintin? Yes, you can open them now. You always said how nice it would be to have a pet. A baby alligator. Oh, no. This one's fully grown. It's a special breed of pygmy alligator. <laughs> Tintin, thank you. It's what I've always wanted. A cute little alligator. Happy birthday, Alan. Hmm. See what I mean? Uh, okay, uh, this is kind of embarrassing. I suppose we should talk about me. I was orphaned as a child and then adopted at the age of 12 by a Cambridge professor. Then I met M Mr. Tracy, and he asked me to help him accomplish his plans for international rescue, and I was delighted to accept his offer. I I I've got to admit, I just love machines. Even when I'm not working, my relaxation is designing new ways to improve my robot, Bremen. Yeah, that's a good move. I'll increase the uh, mega decibars by, say, 15 degrees. Don't you want to watch Operation Sun Probe, Brains? I I'd prefer to fix Brayman, Mr. Tracy. He's still far too impulsive. But Brains, they're going into orbit in five minutes. Four and one quarter minutes to be precise, Mr. Tracy. One character did bridge the gap between the, 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 the character ca characters and the, and the goody-goody good, the characters. That was Brains, who was half in one camp and half in the other. Uh, uh, let's see if my improvements on you have worked. Um, it's your move. Take me. I, I don't believe it. Surely it, it can't be true. A machine cannot have a brain better than mine. I picked on that a voice aspect where he stuttered slightly because sometimes people with you know, who are geniuses and whose brains go like in a million miles an hour, they can't get the words out fast enough to keep up with that. So it was, I, 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 you know, I... I. Uh, the transistors are very uh, small in Lady Penelope's compact. Uh, that accounts for the faint uh, reception. But they are extremely robust. Yeah, uh, but, but it's, it's still a, f a fair uh, distance away. Uh, m maybe it's not coming here. Uh, maybe it's uh, headed for the uh, island of Moila. Kirano, my half-brother, you will help me. Kirano! <laughs> Kirano, it is useless to resist my power. The secret of the lake must be mine. Speak, Kirano. Speak. Ah! Answer me. Was there certain element of the supernatural included in the makeup of the hood, of course? He had those magic eyes that would light up from time to time and spread his particular brand of evil round the, round the scene. He's a pretty n nasty guy. I've been on the receiving end of those eyes myself. Once, on an expedition into the desert to recover some special treasure, I answered a knock at the door a little too hastily. Who 
Who are you? What do you want? What would you do then, my friend? <laughs> Inform your friends at International Rescue? No, that is out of the question, I'm afraid. Where are the others? He buried what me in the you... sand, and I I'd have been a goner if Scott Why hadn't arrived to get me out. But there was always a great deal of enjoyment about his villainy. He was an old-fashioned villain, and really rather nice underneath it all, you often felt. Curse those foolish boys! Curse their stupid father, and curse International Rescue! Lady Penelope speaking. This is a hot one, Penny. Foreign agents are fleeing Britain. They must be stopped. And you've only got a couple of hours. You rang, milady? Penelope and Parker are often at the center of our operations. They're quite a team. Together with their pink Rolls Royce, Fab One. Oh well, down the hatch. Jink. Uh, beg pardon, milady, uh, but the jink was drunk. <laughs> Lady Penelope is a mean driver, especially when she's in a hurry. We're approaching a tree, madam. Ma madam, it's a tree. There's a tree to me! Journey's end. What a pleasant drive. I must do this more often, Parker. And make no mistake, Lady Penelope may look cute, but underneath she's as hard as titanium. You know, I've often felt I'd like to do something exciting, 
Pack being a secret agent. Well, it's not all romance, you know. In actual fact, in reality, it's a tough existence. Never being yourself. <laughs> uh, someone like you, so sheltered and gentle, it just wouldn't be you. With all due respect, you're... Well, you're just not the type. You see, we walk with danger as a shadow. Death is a constant companion. I know, Penelope, you just be what you are. A very beautiful lady. Parker, or, or nosy Parker, to his friends, had a reputation as one of the world's finest safe crackers until he got caught and ended up in jail. Lady Penelope heard of his talents and offered him a working partnership. He, he's quite a character. Jolly boatkin weather. Da, 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 dee, da, da. Oh, yes. When Cook sees me in this gear, she'll be like putty in me hands. think we might have a bit of ash, milady? I'm sorry, Parker, but if you used a modern detector, you might... A stethoscope, ma'am, was good enough for my father, and for my father's father, and before him, my father's... Yes, yes, all right, Parker. It was just a suggestion. Stand by with retros. Standing by. No! Parker, are you all right? Parker? Look, there he is. My favourite character is Parker, and that is because um, one of our puppeteer sculptors, John Blundell, created the head, which was a, nothing short of a wonderful head. In the case of Parker particularly, uh, as a character, I was trying to think about the kind of cliché uh, butlers in uh, typical black and white English comedy films. Sherry, belady. Just a half a glass, please, Parker. Then we'll start serving, shall we? Very good, Belady. The profile is very extremely important, and it, look at him, he looks a little bit like a parrot, but that shape, that profile, his nose and his lip, are two of the key elements of his character. Oh, dear. The butler's work is never done. Oh, well... I shall have to finish reading about the killer of Clapham some other time. Coming. I used to go to um, a pub every day for lunch. And at this pub there was a waiter by the name of Arthur who was very, very proud because he had worked for Her Majesty in Windsor Castle. Okay? And so he was constantly dropping his H's and then putting them all back in the wrong place. But this patter fascinated me. So I thought, right, this is going to be the voice of Parker. There's something up ahead, my lady. Looks like somebody's had a accident. Shall I stop, my lady? We went out to lunch in this pub restaurant in Cookham, and um, he said, I'm going to ask this guy to come over. I think he was a sort of wine waiter, basically. You know. And uh, he, got, he came over and he said, uh, Would you like to see the wine list, sir? <laughs> and Jerry sort of looked at me and I looked at Jerry and we kept, it kept him talking a bit and it turned out he was a, a, a retainer in the, in, in the royal household. I think possibly the Duke of Windsor when he was the Prince of Wales, you know, and he said he was, he was a gent, he was, you know, he was a good bloke, you know. Would you like the Borgellis? I can recommend the Borgellis. So that was the basis of Parker. 
<laughs> jolly good show. What? Any time, your lordship. Any time. Yes, Parker. But I think that will be all. One accentuates things to make them real. Sometimes you sort of... They're still real, but you, you sort of mark them up a bit. And the aspirates, the dropped hitches, and, you know, and the other way round, you know. There's not a window or door had locked, belady. Oh, dear, then I'm afraid there's only one thing left for us to do, seeing that men's lives depend on it. Great. So about her trouble you for the loan of an airpin, belady? Early on in the scripts, you know, I mean, you know, if you were saying, oh, yes, my lady, yes, my lady. But then, uh, when one treated it, and uh, and then it became this catchphrase: "Parker, yes, belady, uh, yes, belady, very well, belady, oh yes, belady, very good, belady, thank you, belady." And, and then there were variations of that. When he was put upon, it was, "Yes, belady, yes, yes, belady." You know, there were all all sorts of variations. Yes, my lady. Yes, belady. Very good, belady. Me, belady. Yes, you. I think to make him uh, charming took, as we say, the curse off his background a bit. A lovable rogue. I know it's a cliche, but he really was a lovable rogue. And he was a lovable reformed rogue. <laughs> Did hair of nothing too clear. Very well, Parker. Oh, just one moment. What have you in that case? I? Oh, case? Oh, uh, oh, you be the... Oh, this one, uh, Belady? Yes, that one. Oh, well, I, uh, I thought I'd take it, you know, just in case. I won. The casino. You know, so we had to put all that money. Oh, now I wonder how they got in there. Parker? Yes, m'lady? Comedy played a very important role, of course, especially between Parker and Lady Penelope. They were... They were, in fact, probably the only comic characters in the series. There were little jokes between the, the father and the sons, but uh, they, were, they were rather a bit stiff. A lot of the humour was very carefully pitched, in as much as some of the gags were slightly near the bone, but uh, we would consider them very carefully, and we would say, look, the young kiddies will never pick that up, but it will probably amuse the adults. And so I think the, the humour helped to make it a family show. Tea, m'lady? Oh, thank you, Parker. Tea on the lawn. And isn't it a lovely day? Oh, yes, m'lady. I, I was just wondering, in fact, if I might have the rest of the half to do it off. I thought I might take Cook out for a punt. Parker? Parker, can you hear me? Loud and clear, lady. Parker, where did you get the champagne? Well, well, lady, it was such a good year, 1998. It seemed a pity to waste it. So I've I slitched it. I mean, have I slitched it? I mean, switched it. I thought that bubbly didn't hit the ship with much of a bang. Parker, what was it that I launched the ship with? Parker was an overnight success. He became famous within a week. And I then thought, am I going to tell Arthur at the King's Arms that Parker was based on him? I thought he might be very proud. But on the other hand, he was very proud of the fact that he worked in Windsor Castle for the Queen and he was a bit of a snob about that. And so finally we decided not to tell him. And Arthur died, never knowing that this famous character was based on him. Home, belady. Home, Parker. By the way, Parker, how did you fare at the casino? Oh, uh, a loosed, belady. Oh, dear. How much? Well, it's, it's a bit difficult. Now, come on, Parker. You can tell me. Well, it, it wasn't so much how much. It was what I lost. 
You know, Parker, you're being very mysterious. What did you lose? Well, you see, I got a bit carried away. I thought I had a sister. Parker, what did you lose? Uh, well, uh, your yacht, my lady. But under the sea, there is danger. Stingray, the famous television submarine, prepares for action. Stand by for excitement. It's a triumph for Stingray, and a further success for technicians at a British film studio. For Parade has been invited behind the scenes of the world-famous television series, Stingray, where skillful science deceives the eye and nothing is what it seems to be. And, as you'll probably guessed, the stars of the studio are man-made puppets, which are known and recognized around the world. For Stingray goes to many different countries, including Kenya and Bermuda. Fashioned from fiberglass and made almost alive by painstaking artistry, they bring the age-old art of puppetry truly into the 20th century. As well as looking true to life, these puppets of tomorrow can talk like human beings as well. A magnet fixed to the back of the head receives electric impulses which move the lips in perfect time to the words they speak. A brand new television series is about to be filmed. The completed puppets, perfect down to the smallest detail, are handed to the expert puppeteers who will bring them to life on the screen. As in any film studio, many different skills are needed. A team of nearly a hundred technicians, cameramen and artists are kept busy producing a different 60-minute film every week. And now all is ready. The director has a final check and the cameras roll. On the TV screen, the program will be in black and white. But on parade, for the first time ever on the cinema screen, you see in color an exclusive presentation of Thunderbirds, the space age story of tomorrow. And don't forget, it's all done with models. It's the year 2000. An atomic airliner comes in to land at London Airport, but the undercarriage won't come down. Radio-controlled elevator cars come out to bring the giant plane to land. But will they hold? Brakes are applied, but the wheels catch fire. They're out of control. Will the plane crash too? We can't tell you, but when Thunderbird reaches the world's TV screens, just ask any child.
emergency. We're under attack. Fire new Zoom. Zoom, the big eyes lolly with three flavor stages. And exciting new picture cards. Three. Zoom. It's new Zoom from Lion's May. New Zoom with three flavor stages has new picture cards. Start collecting famous cars. There's one free with every Zoom. On sale now. Five, four, three, two, one. Kellogg's Sugar Smacks are go. Plenty of Thunderbirds energy fast when you need it. The Thunderbirds team all have Sugar Smacks for breakfast. You'll love these honey sweet pops of wheat. Don't be left behind. Kellogg's Sugar Smacks are go. F-A-B. Hi there, fans. Stand by for Cool Off with Lion's May. New Supersonic Zoom, the big ice lolly with free picture cards. Hey, get this. New Super Sea Jet, a three-flavor knockout. And the first ice lolly specially for girls. It's fab. Unfasten your seatbelts, lolly lickers. Cool it with Lion's Maid. On sale now. Five, four, three, two, one. Thunderbirds are go. actions we had to try and avoid. Walking was never very successful. Um, we, we, we used walking progressively less and less as the series progressed. Um, and ways were devised to show people arriving into rooms and sitting down by cut, cutting away to other characters in the middle of, of conversations. Uh, the reason that, that uh, we didn't walk the puppets very much in full length was because uh, it it didn't look human enough, I think, was the reason. Uh, it's all right with a, like a cartoon character to give it a funny sort of walk with a puppet. But with these that looked more human, you could never really get the, the walk to look convincing. But I always tried to, myself, try to be a bit more ambitious. For instance, in an episode called The Cham Cham, Lady Penelope had to do a, a kind of slow foxtrot across the ballroom floor with one of the characters. Well, it's certainly funny that our paths have never crossed before, Miss Lamour. I know most of the warblers in show business. Always been around, you know. High society keeps me pretty busy. Tintin and Lady Penelope had to go skiing. Parker had to fall down in a snowball down one of the Alps. Oh, my goodness. They appear to be heading this way. Oh, dear, I'm sure this isn't doing Parker's vertigo any good. I, I must apologise for the unconventional entrance, milady. We had lots of inserts of human hands. These puppets could only do certain movements, or if, if they had to do special movements, it was enormously time-consuming to get them to do it. So that we'd often have one of the characters, Scott or Alan Tracy, reaching forward painfully as if to, to touch something, and then we'd cut to a very human hand dressed in a, a rubber glove, 
pushing a button or pulling a lever. It never quite worked. It never convinced the, the, the viewers, I don't think. They saw through it all. They saw this was a real hand and not a puppet. But I think it was one of the, one of the, the gimmicks that en endeared the series to its viewers. I quite liked the fact that it, they never looked totally real. I think that was part of the charm, that they were not real, that they were almost real, but not quite. And I think that was what engaged them to lots of the viewers and the fans. But as far as I'm concerned, it didn't matter. If the figure's strong enough in its character, you won't notice strings or anything else. Strings? What do they mean, strings? I certainly never noticed any strings. And there's another equally dastardly rumour involving the use of synthetic material. Polystyrene was the main material that was used. It had only just entered the scene in those days, but it was a very interesting material in as much as it looked different to what it was. It looked like a rock in some cases. You could paint it and put it on the set and shape it. It was very light, portable, so it could be used as a wall. I think that was the main new material that we used. Interiors of television sets, radios, toothpaste tube tops, whatever, as long as it had wires and junctions in and looked important. You know, we made 32 episodes of Thunderbirds, at least so far, and we seem to have become rather famous all over the world. But you know, there's always one thing that's bothered me. I've always felt as British as the rain in summertime, so... How come I'm an American? When Thunderbirds was made, and indeed today to an extent, British programmes were not welcome in America. They were very, very difficult to sell in the States. And here I was making shows that were extremely expensive and needed to sell well in America to get the money back. Oh, bang on. Jolly good show. How am I doing, Penny? Oh, <laughs> Splendidly, Jeff. And having thought about it, I decided that we in this country are well used to watching American product. We don't resent it and we understand it. And also the subject was about modern technology, space technology and so on. So I thought, well, the best thing to do is make it as an American show. You're dash clever, what? And when we went to the States, yes, people believed they were American shows, bought them. And the money came back to this country, and we were able to make um, uh, more series. Well, thanks for dropping by, but I really must be getting on with my experiment. Oh, before I go, I thought you might like to have a look at some rare archive footage from the making of the Thunderbird series. It was made in 1965, so it's in black and white. As they say in the movies, that's all, folks. Action! And so another scene in the Adventures of International Rescue is shot at the AP Film Studios in Slough, the safety town. Supermarionation is a new dimension in adult entertainment and the actors start here in the puppet workshop under the guidance of Birmingham sculptor John Brown. Heads are first made in plasticine, then moulded in glass fibre. Moving lips and eyes are added and then the crowning glory, the hair in the latest styles. Each main character has up to five heads with different expressions to suit the mood. The rest of the puppet is made in a plastic and is in the perfect proportion of one-third human stature with the hands and feet to suit the fitting. Any character can be made up from these interchangeable components. Each dressed puppet costs between 250 and 300 pounds. Often, two units are shooting at once, so an identical twin is made. Of the four film stages used for shooting Thunderbirds, two are for the special effects department under the inventive control of director Derek Meddings. Derek, how do you evolve the futuristic designs of your models? 
Well, usually I just start doodling on a pad and uh, whatever happens, uh, that's usually what we get in the time. Sometimes we have to dress them up a bit. What limits do you put on probability? Well, there aren't any limits as far as we're concerned. We try anything and uh, if it doesn't work, then we usually cut round it. But uh, nine times out of ten, they work. Uh, there isn't any, as far as we're concerned, nothing is impossible in the special effects. How many special effects go into a, an episode? Well, they vary. Some, uh, mostly, they're around about 90 per hour. Some, you know, they range up to 105. We've had as many as 130 in a, in a film. And uh, then we've really got problems. What are your greatest problems in the effect line? Anything that flies. Because it's always the wires, losing the wires against cloud and blue sky. So we have to, uh, well, we have secret little ways of doing it. And I'd rather not say how it's done. How do you maintain such realism? Well, we do little things that I think people don't, uh, they're not aware of when they look at a vehicle. But if a vehicle goes through screen, then we do a dust trail behind it. So there's always a certain amount of dust coming from a, uh, the back of the truck or lorry, car, whatever it is. And then we have all the wheels sprung independently so that they get this movement and they don't just bounce up and down like a toy. And shooting at high speed, around about 72 frames, and sometimes as much as 120. That's as opposed to? 24. Which is normal. Yes, frame. but we can't shoot at 24. Not, there's very few shots we can do at 24 on the special effects. Mm -hmm. Even if we shoot water, we always have to shoot at 72 frames so that it slows it down just that right amount to give us the realism again. Boats, things like this, we use um, little um, gadgets on the back that give us the wake. These are the things, if they're not there, people know that something's wrong with the shot and they're not really sure what it is, but if it's there, they just accept it. It's just like using any other, or just like watching any other boat going through picture. When you were a boy, were you fascinated by explosions? Yeah, I'm very destructive by nature. <laughs> I think that's why I'm in the special effects. Backstage, there's a vast empire of scenic design and model making. Everything is custom designed and built to scale. Houses, spaceports, Thunderbird craft, vehicles down to guns and watches. After use, they're either stored for the future or scavenged for new creations. All the models are identically reproduced in various scales to suit the scene, and a perfect continuity must be maintained. It's a model maker's paradise, spoiled only by the dirtying down process needed to give realism. Every kind of material is utilised, and the ingenuity of the operatives is endless, a great challenge that adds to the appeal. The puppets work on the sets under blistering arc lights ten times stronger than normal, and their actions are controlled by 12-foot wires from above. Well, son, yes, you get settled down for the night. Gosh, Dad, how can I settle down in all this excitement? Well, you the pre-recorded dialogue is fed through a lip-sync machine and the word impulses are transmitted to a solenoid in the character's head, causing the lips to move in perfect time with its voice. This near-realism is synonymous with all the work done by the AP film team of over 100. You be a good boy and get up to sleep. The series is shot in full Eastman colour and is already being shown in Canada, Australia, Holland and Japan. But what is the adult appeal? The best man to answer this is Thunderbird's creator, Jerry Anderson. Well, of course, this is a, this is a question I would like to know the answer to because we, we very much want the films to have ad adult appeal. Uh, I think that it's probably the technical fascination of seeing model characters and model machines um, behave in, in a realistic way on the screen. I think it is the wonderment, much the same way as with the Disney cartoons, one looked at animated figures and you know, couldn't believe that they, in fact, weren't real. And of course, I think from the point of view of creating fantasy, it is important to uh, make fantasy as believable as possible so that it is acceptable. This is what we try to do. What of the future? Live actors? Well, this is, this is a difficult one to answer. It's a question we ask ourselves at least once a week. Uh, I would very much like to make films with live actors, but of course the 
problem is that with live actors you have to accept their faces as they are. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it would be quite as simple to get the strong characters that we succeed in getting in our films. And of course, there would be many difficulties in creating the sort of situations we create at the moment with live artists. But I think one day, yes, we hope so. Whether the actors are human or puppets, Thunderbirds adds up to a unique contribution to world entertainment. Thunderbirds are go. FAB 